Good morning. I'm Hussain Haqqani. I'm uh, the director for South and Central Asia here at the Hudson Institute. Um, as most of you might know, uh, the Hudson Institute was founded in 1961 by strategist uh, Herman Kahn uh, to challenge conventional thinking and to help manage strategic transitions to the future through interdisciplinary studies in defense, international relations, economics, healthcare, technology, culture, and law. Um, we have now started a series of programs on uh, the future of South Asia uh, based on uh, the fact that India and Pakistan have now been independent for 70 years, and their trajectories matter uh, to the rest of the world. Uh, Pakistan is the fifth most populous country in the world and has the fourth largest nuclear arsenal. Yet more than 55 million Pakistanis live below the poverty line. And since Pakistan's creation in 1947, its economy has by and large remained fragile, heavily dependent on donor interventions. Uh, economic uncertainty is complicated by rising political instability continuing threats of extremism and growing international isolation. Uh, we have had several programs here uh, about U.S.-Pakistan relations, about potential U.S. policy, and therefore uh, <clears throat> we have come under criticism occasionally of having a relatively pessimistic view about Pakistan. So what better way to compensate for it than to look at somebody who has offered or given opportunity to, uh, to somebody to talk to us who has uh, written a book which takes a very interesting perspective. First of all, let me introduce our uh, principal speaker. Uh, Dr. Nadeem Haq is a dear friend, an entire career at the IMF uh, as an economist, and he also was the deputy chairman uh, of the Planning Commission of Pakistan, uh, which, by the way, is actually the head of the Planning Commission because uh, he's called deputy chairman only because uh, one of Pakistan's military rulers wanted himself to be the chairman. Uh, so therefore, no, that's so, in India also it's the same thing. Uh, and, Both and, countries have the same and, thing. And, 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 and in India, the prime minister uh, is the chairman, whereas uh, uh, the deputy chairman is the man who actually uh, does the economic planning and thinking. And he has written a very unusual book. Uh, the book is called Looking Back, How Pakistan Became an Asian Tiger by 2050. Before I come to the book, let me introduce uh, our other speaker, Dr. Marvin Discuss it, discuss it. It's only one thing. Dr. Marvin Weinbaum. I was going to say that in my next session. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, that uh, Dr. Marvin Weinbaum is at the Middle East Institute. He is the uh, doyen of Pakistan and Afghanistan studies in Washington, D.C., and I always refer to him as Ustaz, which basically means teacher. Uh, and his experience and his knowledge would be immensely valuable to all of us in discussing uh, Nadeem's uh, book and Nadeem's ideas. Uh, Nadeem's book basically uh, takes a very unique approach to understanding the economy, society, politics, and policy in Pakistan. Uh, uh, Nadeem says that he wants to spark a debate among young members uh, of pa uh, Pakistan society, uh, the Pakistani media, students, and other thinking groups by creating a fictional story of Pakistan's success. So instead of dealing with the hard facts of today, he projects and says, We've resolved the hard facts, and we've reached 2050. And this is why and how Pakistan can be a success story in 2050. So in a, in, in a very different approach, his approach is rather different. We had Dr. Aisha Jalal, the historian here not long ago, uh, and she had taken a historic view of uh, Pakistan's uh, 70 years and said that basically Pakistan's resilience is its greatest strength. It's having survived these 70 years against all predictions means it'll survive for another 70, 140 years, whatever, uh, if it needs to. Um, and, uh, and so she took a backward-looking approach. Um, Nadeem's approach is forward-looking. Um, as you will find in the course of the discussion, there will be some questions about whether either of those approaches is correct, uh, whether the better approach is to analyze what is and then deal with it and say, 
where is it stuck, where are <clears> things <throat> likely or unlikely to change. So before um, we have a discussion among ourselves, and Dr. Weinbaum has agreed to be the discussion, uh, I will ask Nadeem uh, to give us a rundown on what he sees as the foundations of a quiet revolution of thought that he thinks is necessary in Pakistan. But before he starts, here's a very important passage from your book that I'm going to read. Quote, somewhere between 2015 and 2020, a quiet revolution of thought had begun in Pakistan. The Pakistani intellectuals began to wake up. Thinkers and motivators began to debate and discuss ideas for change. The closest we have to a turning point is a series of decisions following the crisis of 2019. The government moved away from funding mega projects and decided to provide some research funding to the previously starved domestic thinking sector. More interestingly, contrary to previous practice, the government did not tie up research possibilities into bureaucratic knots. Quite independently, university administrations were freed of academic controls and allowed to expand their faculties on their own terms, based purely on quality. Before 2020, universities were buildings devoid of professors. By 2021, professors were being attracted and competition in research and funding was beginning to develop. And so this was the environment in which the change came that helped Pakistan reach the point. And there are very other interesting propositions, which especially the Pakistanis in the audience and those who are watching us on live stream, and uh, they're watching us on www.hudson.org. Uh, it's being live streamed. Uh, they will all find very interesting is uh, how uh, did we get there? Uh, so among the interesting things that happened by 20 50 years that the number of ministries had been cut down to five, ten, uh, ten. ten. ten ministries uh, 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 instead of the current uh, more than two dozen. No, uh, 50. More than 50, gosh. Uh, I'm never that good with numbers, Nadeem, as you are. <laughs> and then similarly, um, uh, <clears throat> the Pakistani diplomatic missions had come down to 20. Pakistan was no longer presumably seeking votes in the UN General Assembly from many, many countries with which it has no trade and no economic relations and had become very realistic. So, Nadeem, let's hear it. How did it happen? Uh, we are in 2050 right now, everybody. And Nadeem, the historian of uh, in 2050, not the economist, is telling what happened between 2015 and 2050 that changed everything. In, other way, in, a, in another way to look at it is that he's telling us what needs to happen for Pakistan to have a very different future than the present that everybody uh, worries about and expresses concern about. So, Nadeem Haq, floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Hussain. Um, let me thank Hussain Haqqani and uh, Aparna Pandey and uh, uh, Rachel and everyone at Hudson Institute for hosting this event. I think it's um, very important that we have a conversation on Pakistan, and that's why um, I tried to inject myself into the debate by writing this book, and I'll come to that. But let me give you, these are all my details here. Anybody who wants to see, I do a podcast, again for the same reasons, to start a conversation, and that's very important. I have a blog, and Hussein and I are both very active on Twitter. Uh, the book is named Looking Back, How Pakistan Became an Asian Tiger. Now, the book, the, the way I published it was to make it available to students in Pakistan, to ordinary people in Pakistan. So I made sure that the book will be available in Pakistan. It's available in Pakistan. Guess for how much? $2.50, 300 rupees. And on Amazon, it's available for $5 because you guys will pay a little bit of a premium. The uh, money is all going to a local guy who's trying to write and do things, etc. and we hope to do something with it. Now, I wrote this book, as Hussain says, rightly so. It's 100 years, Pakistan at 100 years. Pakistan in 2050, Pakistan will be 100 years old then. And yeah, I transport myself in time. I'm taking a future vision of Pakistan. But then I felt very vindicated once I'd published it. 
other people will laugh and it'll be a joke, etc., etc. Fair enough. Yeah, it's a joke, fair enough. But I was vindicated. Look what happened. The World Bank is doing a study spending real money and a lot of money, and it's Pakistan at 100. They're doing a study, Pakistan at 100. They're spending real money. They've got 20, Pakistani, 20 economists all around the world doing this study. So they came to see me, and I told them, hey, guys, I'll sell it to you for $10,000. Just forget this. <laughs> Sorry. We, in bureaucracies, you can't make a trade. So I said, OK, I'll give it to you for free. Why don't you save your money? But they're still doing it. So you can wait for the result. It'll come three years later. It'll be a very glossy publication. It'll be, you know, tons of tables, etc., which you won't find in my book. So there it is. So that's one of the things. But let's see. The story begins here. In 1992, I did a paper called The Content Analysis of Newspapers in Pakistan. Because I was, and I still am very frustrated with the debate in Pakistan. So I went ahead and I looked at all the newspapers and I said, what are they publishing? In those days, there was no television. So I looked at what they were publishing. What I found is we are obsessed with foreign policy and security. We write so much on foreign policy and security. We think, this is my standard joke with people in Pakistan, we think that every morning the president of the US, now Donald Trump, wakes up and he asks where Pakistan is. He has breakfast and he asks, where, what is Pakistan doing? Then he has some. Everybody thinks the world is obsessed with Pakistan. And it's very difficult to tell them, look, guys, nobody cares. <laughs> so I don't know why we are obsessed with this thing. The second thing now with the television media coming along, which we are obsessed with is every evening, there are these people on television, all of whom have one title. It's called senior analyst. And I always ask, where is the junior analyst? Nobody tells me a junior analyst. So anyway, everybody is a senior analyst. And all the senior analysts are doing is, again, talking foreign policy and security. But they add one more thing which is speculation. So today they're all wild. Nawaz Sharif is back. What's happening? Is there a deal? Is there not? They've got all kinds of analyses going on on that. Nobody knows anything. But everybody has a fly on the wall. Everybody has a birdie that's talking to him in the ear. And they've got speculation galore. And that's all we do. Although we have, I'll come to that, we have dynastic politics. So it's not much reason to speculate, but we do. What is my gripe? What is missing is this. I count op-eds even today. In Pakistan now, there are about, I don't know how many papers. But when you count the op-eds, 80% of them are foreign policy or politics or something like that. Economics, I think, is even less than 10%. We don't talk economics at all. So that's one of the reasons that I thought, hey, let's see if we can get some economics into the, into the debate. So today, what we are doing is, please, Today, let's try and discuss economics, not you do the usual Pakistani thing of taking economics into the realm of politics or taking, saying, hey, it's all foreign policy. If you solve the foreign policy, economics will be solved. I promise you it won't. That's a joke. What I'm trying to do, I hope, is take a fresh approach to economics, a fresh analysis, a fresh way of looking at economics. But having said that, I will never argue with you that this is the only way. There are a number of solutions here. I'm presenting one. And please come up with your own. And this is the whole point. Let's have a conversation in economics, a sub-conversation in all that political and foreign policy noise that we've got in Pakistan. And unfortunately, unless we solve our economic problem, no amount of other stuff is going to help us. Now, economics books are very boring. That's why I didn't do it that way. You know, they call us a dismal scientist. We also write in a boring way. I remember the Indian ED in the fund once told me, you know, you deal with the most boring subject in the world and you write it in the most boring way. So I mean, it really requires a lot of st uh, strength to read this stuff. We write very boring stuff. And what we do is we have lengthy descriptions and we have great tables and we have lovely charts and we think that we are making a difference. Hayek, a long time ago, a famous economist, a Nobel Prize winner in his Nobel Prize winning speech said, this is a pretense of knowledge. It's not knowledge itself. And so please be aware that we do this. And I wanted to depart from that. The, what we've got really is an engineering model in mind. Everybody thinks that the economy, I bet if I ask you some questions, all of you will give me answers. And your answers will be the same. I can predict them right now. Fix the fiscal deficit. 
get the IMF program going. <laughs> Masood Ahmed is here. He knows he's done this many times. Get the IMF program going. We can have everything happening and then to bring in the World Bank, do some education, do some social sectors in Pakistan. Problem will be solved. This is the received wisdom in economics. That is the engineering economics wisdom. It puts the finance minister in the, in, a, in the seat of a pilot that he can somehow pilot the economy and all finance ministers puff up and they feel, oh, I'm really making the economy work. Whereas I know I've been there. They have no control over the economy. And we'll talk about that, right? So let's get away from engineering economics and look at something else. There is a better way to do economics. But let me come to my main task now. My main task is first to tell you a joke and then a story, right? The story of the book. The joke is this. You might have heard, of, heard it, but it's worth repeating. There is this economist, or should I say Pakistani social scientist. Can I, Sorry? We need to stand a little bit so that the camera can actually capture you. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> My mistake. So where should I be? You can be here. You can just stand there. Okay. Move a little less. Move a little less. Okay, great. <laughs> apologies, apologies. Okay. Sorry. We keep forgetting that technology is here now. Okay. So the point is that um, this, uh, the joke, there is a Pakistani social scientist or an economist or an analyst from the World Bank or whatever. He is sitting under a lamp with his computer out, taking measurements and looking around. So a stranger passes by and says, my friend, what are you doing? He says, I've lost my keys. I'm looking for my keys. So he says, what? OK. So he says, let me help you. So they work, look around for about half an hour, 45 minutes. And then the stranger turns around and says, let's start at the beginning. What happened? Where did you lose your keys? He said, well, I was coming out of my car, and the keys dropped. He says, well, where's your car? He said, the car is about a mile away. Why are you looking here? Because the light is here. So most of our analysis tends to be where the light is. We always think we get fiscal data, so analysis is fiscal. We get some education data, analysis is education. We have some analysis of foreign policy, we have that. We have a segmented analysis in our world, and that is what I want to cut through. So we've got this book now. Now, as Hussein said, let's transport ourselves. We have a time machine. We get to 2050. 2050, we have Pakistan has become a nation tiger, as I said, per capita income of $12,000 and north of that. Um, all good things are happening here. Social indicators are looking good. Excellent cities, modern place. People, kids are even coming from overseas to study in Pakistan. Tourism is taking off. You know, Fundamentalism is gone, terrorism is gone. Pakistan is really one of those cities that everybody is inviting to join the OECD and do many things, etc. So Pakistan has done very well. And Pakistan has grown at an average per capita income, average growth, uh, average economic growth of 10% per annum for more than 20 years, 25 years. It's grown very consistently. China is the only country that has done so far. Now, Pakistan has done this again. And the world is kind of confused what is happening. So the discussion comes up, and the UN Secretary General says, let's set up a commission. So they get some Nobel Prize winners, some good professors, etc., And they say, guys, let's do a study. So the commission goes to Pakistan to take a look at what's happening there. They come to Pakistan. The UN Commission set up in 2051. They come to Pakistan. They look at Pakistan. They review it. In the review, they come to the, this that, hey, by 2020, Pakistan doesn't look good at all. Pakistan has all kinds of problems. There's not only fundamentalism, there's poverty, there's all kinds of things that are going wrong. This is what Hussain was alluding to today. We have problems today. I'm not denying we have problems today. But as I said, I'm not negative on Pakistan. I'm totally positive on Pakistan. I want to tell a story that's positive, and I will give you reasons why I think we should be positive, and why we can all buy calls on Pakistan and say, hey, Pakistan will go places. Okay? So given that, Pakistan uh, now is 
a developed country, uh, sorry, right now has problems at, in 2020. I'm talking about the report. So don't let me give you my views. Pakistan has got problems. Pakistan has all kinds of problems. Least, most of all, Pakistan is a country with a high population growth rate. The census just came out. Our population growth is roughly 2.4%. We had thought three years ago it had gone down to 1.8, but it's still 2.4. When I was in the planning commission, we did this exercise, and we saw that there were 90 million kids under the age of 20. Today, with the new census, I think there are 110 million kids under the age of 20. And those 110 million kids, there are two ways of looking at it. One is a youth dividend. The other is a threat. So depending on what we do with them, they could be a threat or they could be a, they could be a boon for the economy. The economy could grow very rapidly. Uh, but unfortunately, the other thing is if you look at all the indicators in, part, in, in the world, and there are, there's a whole industry that collects indicators like competitiveness, like fragile states, like... Um, cost of doing business, all kinds of indicators. On all indicators, Pakistan right now is very low. It's really in the bottom, 20% um, or 30%. So Pakistan is not doing well at all in 2020. Now, what happens? People uh, find, a, but at the same time, it's not as if Pakistan is, um, it's at the same time, it's not as if Pakistan is totally a basket case. How Pakistan is failing. Yes, on some lists in 2020, Pakistan is put on what is called a fragile state. You know, this, this thing comes up all the time. Think tanks need to do something. Donors need to do something. Consultants need to do something. So they come up with these new terms. The newest term is fragile states. And DFID has just put up 50 million pounds to study fragile states. And that 50 million pounds is going to create a lot of narrative. A lot of narrative. And that 50 million pounds is going to now sort out country. Pakistan has been put in the list of fragile states. So that's where we are right now. Now, I think there is a positive solution here, right? Um, sorry, not a positive solution. Right now, I will say even today, this is what the report says, even today, it's not as if there are no positive trends in Pakistan. It's not as if Pakistan is totally fragile. Pakistan is going down. The report says no, even today, there are positive trends. Yes, the youth is a possible problem in the future. But today, the youth is a positive problem because the youth is finding ways to do things. One of the things that they're doing is they're going overseas, migrating. We are getting $18 billion in remittances. That remittance is spread, spreading through the population. It is creating a great um, equal opportunity for everybody. We are seeing the rise of a middle class. We are seeing poverty decline. Poverty has declined um, um, by a large number over the last 10 years. Even the World Bank now, I think Eric will confirm it, even the World Bank now admits it. The poverty has gone down. At the same time, we have uh, the middle class, which we've substantiated in many ways, and you've seen Wall Street write about it, you've seen many people write about it. The middle class is growing, which represents a great opportunity for foreign investors to come in and take opportunities. So Pakistan is a big market. It's a market of about 200, 210 million people now. So that is a big opportunity. Now, where it is negative is where people are failing. Where we are failing is, at this time, and this is what the report says, it's the policy and government. Got a very volatile growth rate and a long-run growth rate that's coming down. Our productivity is declining. Our savings and investment are not picking up. So that is the situation. People are finding a way out. They're creating an informal economy. People are finding a way out. But the government is the one that is losing. Okay? Now, prior to the reform, what do we have? What, do we, what the report notes is prior to reform, what we have is a policy-making situation where the government is not making good policy. The government is incapable of making good policy. At the same time, um, the um, the um, uh, government is forced into a crisis mode. I'll come to that later. And the government um, seems to favor projects over programs. And this is an important point to think about it. What happens, as Hussain sort of told you, in the passage that he read out, somewhere in the, you can take your pick, time is not hard, because it's a story. I can pick out my own timeline. Somewhere in the 20s, late 
teens or 20s, there is a groundswell of thinking in Pakistan. The 150 or so universities that we've created, which right now don't seem to be looking very good, but there seems to be research coming out, there seems to be thought coming out, and this is an area that I'll come to. This is an important point, and because everybody asks me, oh, what you're suggesting, how will change happen? What is your model of change, I ask you? The model of change that comes out in Pakistan all the time is very simple. It's a leadership that'll do it. So we must find a good leader that somehow we can, so they sometimes look to the army, sometimes the politicians, sometimes Imran Khan, some, everybody thinks that change is top down. What I'm arguing now is change is bottom up. Milton Root is here, he's a professor at GMU, he's done some work on complexity and I'll come to complexity. It's all based on that, that change has to be bottom up and I'm fictionalizing it to be a groundswell of academics, but we can discuss that and we should discuss that, why it happens, when will it happen, etc. right? Uh, but the point is, this change comes organically. Our model of change today is, as I said, top down. The second model of change is that change will come from Washington. Change will come from World Bank, the fund, or thinkers out here. But that change will never be understood there. Still, it'll come. And that's something we'll talk about. Now, briefly on the methodology, as I said. Although I've written this book in fictional form, I stand by the analysis. And the analysis is not, you know, just stories. The analysis is based on complex adaptive systems, which is a new way of analyzing um, economics, uh, but, but a technique that has been growing over the last 20 years. But since 2008, it has become very popular and a very important way of looking at economics. This approach basically is saying, let us stop looking at the economics in the fragmented fashion that we do. As I described to you, we think of the economics as fiscal policy, current account of the situation. We think of it as education, health, and you know, it's snippets and fragments. We think that snippets and fragments will solve the problem. Whereas the complex adaptive system, and Hilton is one of the guys who works on this, complex adaptive system says you have to look at the system as a whole and how it's evolving. Don't just look at a snippet now and again, hey, let me look at the fiscal situation now. Let me turn around and look at this or that. No, we have to look at the system as a whole and see where the system is. It has a history. Uh, Hussein mentioned Aisha Jalal. Yes, it has a history. We have to look at the history. We have to see where we are today and then decide where we are going. And at the same time, this also says, this approach also says, you cannot engineer the economy. You cannot push the economy to go wherever it wants, wherever you want it to go. The economy has an evolutionary dynamic of its own. It's traveling through time. That economy will not change its course just because Nadeem Ullak says so or so-and-so says so. We have to understand where the economy is going and we have to move with it. And we have to try and see whether the policy can nudge the economy. So the term, operative term is nudge the economy, not necessarily tell the economy where to go. So for example, people tell me all the time, kids are not coming to school. They don't want to come to school, but we must force them to come to school. Well, if they're not coming to school, there must be a reason. Try and figure that out. Don't force them. But that's too much of a thing, um, change for economists to think of. So that's the approach. I won't say much more about methodology. That's a wholly different uh, subject, and we shouldn't talk much about it, but it's an important departure from the current economics, and that's what I live with and I work with. Okay. So, these networks, as Hussain said, 2015-20, there was a ground cell of research, etc., but networks emerged. The first thing to remember, you and I giving ideas, Hussain Akani giving ideas, Nadimullah giving ideas, <coughs> oh, hum, who cares? Who cares? We are individuals. This was said last weekend, very interestingly, by Neil deGrasse Tyson. Is that right? That's the right name? Neil deGrasse Tyson on Fareed Zakaria. And it's an important point, and I took um, note of that. I said, hey, this substantiates what I'm saying. He said, Fareed Zakaria asked him about climate change. He said, yes, there is a controversy on climate change. You will always find in science that there are controversies in everything. You will find all kinds of scientists pushing a paper for this viewpoint or that viewpoint. We don't look at every paper. We look at 
the citation community. Where are people converging in their views? And that's important. He said 80% of the climate scientists say, yes, there is a problem. So we have to accept it. The five, few people, one or two percent, who say there isn't a problem, forget them. And there's the same thing here. Networks might what is networks? Networks are people who said, okay, guys, I am now forming a network of this or whatever. We can go into that. But point is essentially people who agreed with each other through deep research, even though there was debate. Emerging out of the debate, citation communities or networks emerge. And those networks then said, they started analyzing the economy. And they said, let's forget about thinking of the economy in snippets. Let's do uh, an analysis of the economy based on evolution and based on where we are. So we are looking at the patterns now. They began to look at the patterns there. And the patterns, they said, first thing they said is the footprint of the government is very large. Footprint of the government, those of you interested in technical stuff, a lot of this stuff will be available in the Planning Commission Framework of Economic Growth, which I developed when I was there in 2013. That Framework of Economic Growth has a lot of the analysis, etc., numbers. The footprint of the government, footprint of the government, not what the government owns. Footprint of the government is where the government interferes, where the government is actually controlling things. That is roughly 70% of the economy, even more. So that leaves very little room for the rest of the country to work on, right? The second thing they said is that we don't have um, the standard approach that we have, all of us, including the donors, including everybody we have is, hey, the government is good. Just tell the government to do it. Standard thing is tell the government to educate people. Tell the government to give them help. Tell the government to do this. What we have in mind is that the government is benevolent. Network said the government is not benevolent, please. First thing is to forget this idea, the government is not benevolent. The government, if anything, Mankur Olson in, in, in uh, um, Maryland here, he used to say the government is predatory. So it's a predatory government that we have to think about. The third thing they said is, hey, we pay lip service to the private sector. We use the term private sector must lead the growth, engine of growth, etc. But the private sector is not a competitive private sector. What we need is a competitive private sector. So they began to talk about that. So this is the analysis that they began. They said that the government, for example, just cited this example. That today we are sitting in 2017. We've had a 10-year power crisis. In 10 years, we've lost 3 trillion rupees. We've lost about 20% of growth, 2% annually because of load shedding, because electricity doesn't come. Yet, there has not been a single report from the government on what the problem is in the power sector. Same thing on Recodec. We've given away a huge resource. We don't know how it was given away. The case is in the court, International Court of Settlements of the World Bank. We're going to get a loss, but nobody knows. Nobody is doing anything about it. So they give these examples saying, look, the government at this stage is really not engaged. It's not capable of doing good stuff. So how we look at it? Just the kind of model that they had in mind. And there is a government. Yes, there is a government. Nobody doubts it. But the government is a game for collecting spoils. What is missing there is, A, there is no process in government. B, the government seldom makes policy. The government makes policy how? The donor does the work for them. So the World Bank will come and make a policy, or the IMF make a policy. Government won't read it, and I've been there. I've done it. And we don't read it, we just sign it. We say, okay, it doesn't matter. Let's get the money. We'll talk about the rest later. Analysis, data, research, there's no such thing left anymore. Now, this is a big problem. To my mind, the government, or to the commission's mind, or to the network's mind, the government is a sum total of these things. If it's not doing this, there's no point, right? The second way to look at the government, they said, is very interesting. They said, think about the government. Who is the government? Government is also a set of agents. Government is not a amorphous concept, concept that we don't know. Government is also a set of people. Who are the people? Most important thing is government is the bureaucrats who run the government. Government is the army who's there because they also keep coming in. They're also a player in the R system. The third thing, which is very important, is government is the politicians. Who are the politicians? They tend to be the rich people, they tend to be the um, industrious, etc. And what happens? What motivates the army and the bureaucrats? We know they don't get paid well, but we know they're very rich. How do they make money? 
they make money through their plots and perks. They get these gifts from the government, which are invisible, which nobody talks about, but they end up at the end of their tenure being very rich, and nobody talks about that, right? Um, what about the industrialists and the and the and the and the, um, uh, and, the and the landlords? They have tax-free status. They have SROs, which are exemptions to the people. So I'm not going to go into great details, but the point is, it should be very clear. What's happening here is that these guys get rents from the government. So the government becomes a rent distribution agency. If you go back, it couldn't make policy. It couldn't do its own work. This is what the fragile state is. This is what donors are beginning to talk about now, the fragile state. The fragility is in the government, right? So what do we have? We have this situation. Every two or three years, we get a crisis. Crisis meaning the political crisis. Sort of for, for us economists, it means something else. It means, hey, there's a balance of payment crisis like now. There's coming, one is coming. Today, if you pick up the dawn, there's an article by Shahid Kardar and Hafiz Pasha, ex-minister and governor of Central Bank. They're talking about the coming crisis, which is going to happen next year, the balance of payments crisis. What happens when you have a crisis? We go to the fund. We get money, and we that's a bailout. We get a bailout. They say there's some, some lip service is paid to the reform, but we never make the reform. What happens is the rent seeking continues. Subsidies, the bad policies all continue. We go back into a crisis. Does anybody know how many fund programs we've had in the last 30 years? Any ideas? Fund program is like, I'll tell you what a fund program is. Sorry? 13. No more. Since 1988. Uh, depends on how you count it. We've been 25 years in a program. Right. Now, think about it. A program is, Masood, will you confirm how many fund programs you had? <laughs> okay. So we've had 25 years of something like that, fund program, large number of programs. 13, you're saying you're also right, because some of them are multi-year. Right? So if you think about it, then these, these programs, uh, what, is, what is a fund program? Fund program is being an emergency ward. Fund is the emergency ward for countries. So we've been in an emergency ward for the last so many years, right? And we'll go in again. That's the thing that the networks noted. This is what is happening prior to the thing. But what is the fund program? Fund program forces, in, forces us in the mode of austerity. I hope everybody knows what austerity is following Greece. Austerity is where you shrink the government to such an extent that public services and, um, you know, governance services cannot pro provide it. For example, in Pakistan now, if you go talk to the police service, they'll tell you that many policemen do not have weapons or petrol, etc., etc. They can't, they don't have the equipment to do their work. Teachers complain they don't have the equipment to do their work. Railways complain they don't have the money to maintain the system. Uh, energy system complains they don't have the money to, uh, money to maintain the system, right? So that is a very important thing to bear in mind, okay? Um, the next thing, this is, and this is what leads to fragility. So that's very important to think about. Okay, so what did the network say? Network said that, look, the problem arises because in Pakistan, social mobility is only through the government, through rents. We haven't developed a modern system of merit-based social mobility, and we have to go in that direction. So that's where we are headed, right? Um, now let's come to the solutions. Solution, they said, and this was implemented somewhere around 25, 30, the solutions came in. The first solution was, hey, contrary to what the current prescription, the current prescriptions, donors, etc., are, hey, let's build some roads, let's do some this thing, let's build this, whatever, get some more money, USAID will come in, DFID will come in. We've had that for 70 years. Network said 70 years of this is enough, nothing is happening. 70 years, these guys have failed, let's do something different. The first thing is we have to build the state. Without building the state, We'll have fragility, we'll have all these things, nothing can be implemented. And what does building the state mean? It means basically three things. First, the constitution. We don't have a constitution that's competitive. We don't have a constitution that has checks and balances. It was a constitution that we copied from the Government of India Act of 1935 without thinking. And that constitution again and again comes to a halt. It has a huge economic cost. Lots of things to talk about. I won't go into it any great thing. The second thing they said is this, the nature of the state has to change from being a predatory state to being a strong and caring state, and there are things that can be done, we can talk about that. Um, the third thing is we must 
decentralized. So there were two big commissions that were set up. One was to talk about decentralization, which meant more states, which meant more, um, you know, um, local government, much more local government. In fact, we don't have local government right now. So it is really localizing the government and building more states. The second thing, the, the third thing that they talk about, fourth thing, which is very important is, and this is something that we don't pay enough attention to, build due process. So we, uh, book talks about there being an, a commission to talk about building due process. How do we build due process? Right now, the way policy is built is Nawaz Sharif or whoever the prime minister or the president is wakes up and says, build that road, and everybody starts building the road. He says, hey, give everybody 10,000 computers, give all those kids computers. Everybody starts giving kids computers. So the network said, that's no way to do policy. There should be due process. Prime Minister can say, build a road, but then there should be technical work that should be done to give proposals and choices that people should do. It. That's what due process is. You're seeing due process right now in healthcare here in, in the US government, right? So why can't we do that in Pakistan? We should have that in Pakistan too, right? I mean, they're debating healthcare, they're talking about it, and that's important. That's what it is for. Now, most people say that, hey, uh, you know, military, uh, civil military imbalance, but that's also because we don't have due process. Remember, due process, all the institutions of governance are the way to resolve conflict. If you don't have due process, you have this little thing, conspiracies and, you know, um, newspapers and television conversations, but no due process, and that's part of the problem. So the networks made, made a big thing out of that. The second thing they said that one of the reasons that we still have all this happening, the rent distribution and all the problems, is because we're continuing with a colonial legacy. The biggest colonial legacy, we've got our whole legal system is a colonial legacy, but the biggest colonial legacy we're continuing with, that they pointed out strongly, is the colonial institutions. The way we organize our civil service, army, judiciary, everything. It's a colonial legacy. And we should talk about how to organize it differently. For example, the civil service sits through the entire country. It's a centralized system. You can never have decentralization with the system. With this system, you can't, because the deputy commissioner runs cities, you can't put in local government with the deputy commissioner running the cities. If you look at D.C., D.C. government has nothing to do with the federal government. D.C. government is totally separate from the federal government. No person of the D.C., no office officer of the D.C. government gets transferred to the federal government. No federal government officer gets transferred to, DC, to the uh, D.C. government. So these are important things to bear in mind. There can be no development further. Further, all professional appointments. Like in the old days, in the colonial days, there was no need for professional appointments. Today, you have to run the energy system. You have to run the education system. All those things are run by the civil service. There are no professional appointments. So these are important things that they talked about. Then they talked about breaking the back. This is the most important thing. Now, everybody in Pakistan says we are an elite-dominated economy. We are an elite-centered economy. But that, to me, is a truism. America is an elite-dominated economy, too. Elite dominates everywhere. You check the elite. You never get rid of the elite. And the way to get rid of the elite is to understand social mobility and to understand due process. And this is something that we haven't done. The networks did that. Donors won't do it. Donors are too busy doing their sector work. But you have to think about it. So they said, let's look at rent-seeking. What is rent-seeking? Rent-seeking has two or three forms. One is government concessions. But the biggest form in Pakistan is land. Everything is a land scam. The bureaucrats get land, the army gets land, even the industrial estates are built for land. And even the bureaucrats and the army get rural land so that they, we can keep the myth of rural development going. So that is very important. Okay, so we have, this is very important. How do we look at rent seeking? How do we develop? So these are very important things that we have to think about. And so they said, okay. The second thing is very important. Our industry has been set up for reasons that were not to build the market, but to give people favors. This old license Raj story. I won't go into, into it any, in any great depth because I'm running out of time, but industry and markets have to be looked at. Distribution of land has to be looked at. Then we come to a very important point. The networks said this. This business of thinking rural development is going to lead Pakistan. Everybody says agriculture will lead Pakistan. Wrong. Historically wrong. Experience shows it's wrong. 
Change happened through the industrial revolution and change happened in cities. So people, I know people don't like it. As in Pakistan, they hate it when I say this. Hey, development is an industry. Hey, sorry, it's a city-based phenomenon. Forget the rural areas. I know people love the rural poor. There's a romantic illusion about them, like what Rousseau had or something. The, the native, what was the term? The native or something, you know? The, but, but for, sorry, the noble savage, right? For God's sakes, the noble savage doesn't do anything until he comes to the city. Right? Noble savage is in his pristine glory, but everything happens. So the networks talk about the city. How do we get the city to work? How do we get the city to be in an engine of growth? Let me give you a simple thing, Pakistan. For example, I did this analysis many times. Just give you a brief flavor of it. In Pakistan, and this is what I come back, government, as I said, owns, uh, sorry, has a footprint of 70%. Government owns most of the real estate in cities. I don't know any of you are familiar with Pakistan, you'll see. You go to Lahore, for example, my city. I mean, government owns everything from the Mal Road to the airport. Because you see the GR on the way, you see the Civil Service Academy on the way, you see this on the way, you see the, the CSD on the way, you'll see the Corps Commander, everything is owned by the, this is the prime commercial land owned by the government. Now, if you just develop that land, just the development of the land could in, invite an investment of billions of dollars. Not millions, billions of dollars. Mall Road, for example, I drew up a plan for Shabazz Sharif. You, could, you can have a $10 billion investment in Mall Road just by allowing, changing the rules. Allow high rise, allow nice commercial construction. But who won't allow it to be done? Who won't allow it to be done? Sorry? No, the bureaucracy. Right? Because why? Because they have their perks and plots there. Now you have to understand the dynamic. This is why I'm saying systems analysis. And I can't explain this dynamic. The dynamic is that, hey, these guys, look at the actors. Don't look at the government. The actors control these things for personal reasons because you've invested in plots and perks. So if we can just rationalize their salaries, make them invest them in reform, professionalize them, break up their monopoly, you can probably have some change. So that's the important thing that we have to What does it come down to? It comes down to this. In the standard economic analysis, the boring analysis, where you have tons of figures and you have tons of charts, they give you long matrices. They give you 20,000 things to do. Uh, they used to come to my office when I was in the planning commission, and they used to give me these matrices. Big, huge job report. I would immediately take it, drop it in the bin. And they'd get very angry. What are you doing? What are you? I said, look, first of all, who has the time to read it? Right? Secondly, by the time I read it, you'll be gone. Right? And thirdly, I mean, who has the time to follow these? I don't even have the people to follow it. I, I know my people. Here... We only have four things to do. We don't have to do 10,000 things. Hey, build a quality government. Hey, build vibrant markets. Build creative cities. And build social capital. That is where you get the youth to uh, get civilized. OK, so what do we have as a result? So the UN Commission notes that, hey, these guys have built an inclusive society. We used to talk about inclusion. They didn't even talk about inclusion, but they built an inclusive society. Women are out. You know, the good things are happening. Remittances are back. All these good things have happened. But more importantly, they said, hey, this is a much more secular Pakistan. How did that happen? They didn't do it deliberately. It happened because things happened through the groundswell. First, the networks came in. The networks presented a new alternative. You don't have to challenge the mullah. You have to present an alternative. Mullah is presenting. I wrote this article for Project Syndicate, the Mullah-led development. Mullah is presenting a vision. We don't present a vision. We present splinters. Hey, education, health, etc. We are not presenting a vision. When you present a vision, you challenge. It's a, it's a, it's a battle of visions. The Mullah is winning because we don't have a vision. Right? Second thing they said, hey, the Mullah is winning because your cities. Anybody looked at the map of DHA? How many people have bought a plot in Defense Housing Authority? Anybody looked at the map of DHA? Let me tell you, Nonisha, you have a house in DHA, right? Let me tell you what happens in DHA. DHA has more mosques than schools. And that's the story of Pakistan. We zoned out schools. We zoned out. Nothing wrong with mosques. Mosques should be there. We zoned out schools. We zoned out public spaces. We have got mosques. So where do kids go? 
kids who are not included who can't go to the gymkhana club who can't go to the islamabad club who can't do they have to go to the mosque who's running the mosque a molvi who doesn't have education so the network said regular to mullah hey i can't practice medicine or whatever being a, i can't be a quack in pakistan i can't practice law nothing how can the mullah not be regulated so the whole thing about regulating the mullah so there are ways of dealing with the molvi but it's not fighting with them it's setting up an institutional base it's setting up a geographical space for people to have experience secularism leisure etc which we haven't done right so out of all this just by doing simple things not necessarily engineering the economy you have emergence of good things and you can go through those good things the results are visible very good results excellent things happening this is what the report is saying now what have we learned we have learned please stop thinking in splinters think in system we have to build a society we have to build an economy we can't think that you know doing little things will do it we also have to change the way we do things it can't be an externally driven agenda it can't be the donors doing everything for us the people have to develop their own solutions that's when it works the best usaid can send robin rafel was there as ambassador to usaid you can send 10000 consultants there robin it won't do anything we have to empower the people to make the change or else the people will take power another way they'll join isis and they'll do it that way simple your choice right so that's the important thing that we we talk about this is what we have this is all that's required i think i challenge anybody this is the analysis that we need and we need to do this and what happens in all the donor prescri- prescriptions we don't do this we do everything else we don't want to change society we don't want to change governance we don't want to, we want to just throw money at them and that's the problem so what we learn is hey guys we have to think differently we have to allow local innovation we also have to allow local failure yes we'll make our mistakes but we must be allowed to make our mistakes best practice is the case of death they come and come and tell us best practice just copy everybody but if you read all self help books they'll tell you don't copy anybody learn from everybody but do things yourself and this is the final answer that i have we have to learn globally this is not to say close down our economy open our economy further but act locally find solutions locally thank you very much i look forward to a conversation is all to have a conversation thank you um thank you so i also have i also have a joke and a story but i'll hold that and dr marvin, marvin weinbaum yeah. has made his comments uh, marvin <laughs> well i don't have a joke or a story but uh, <laughs> maybe a few comments and I, i'll be brief because we want to leave time for you to uh, ask your questions get these get responses uh, <clears throat> look I, i i think if this book had been written by a woolly haired you know glossy eyed academic uh we we could we could say well you know that's what it is uh, you know i used to be one of those so i can tell <laughs> um woolly headed i guess is the expression uh but i think what you had here was an exposition uh by someone who comes to this you know as realistic in his own way about what is out there what has to change and that's what makes I think this different. Uh he knows what he's saying. And of course you got uh full <laughs> uh critique here uh and so in that sense there was more looking backward than <laughs> than you may have wanted. We yeah, wanted it. Right. Uh and uh <clears throat> Let me also say that the book is a, is a good read. It's it's fact it's a, it's a very good it, he writes beautifully it, it, it's witty uh it's uh it, it's non-technical and i think therefore you uh you will whatever your level of sophistication with economics concern you don't have to worry about that uh now if i as a discussant were challenged to say well you know oh oh critique it uh, you know what what uh, what's wrong you know well you know this is would be unfair this is aspirational this book uh 
it is out there to provide some guideposts here and and to be and to encourage this kind of development not just to predict it but to encourage it i think this is essentially what what you're trying to do it's promotional and that's very good but if if i or you want to pick it apart you can't have this you can't have that uh, this is this would be unfair because uh obviously it it, it 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 it's a leap of faith here but one which is not entirely uh based on uh on potential kinds of change let me having said that suggest though that there would in order for this to take place because it's focused so heavily on economic change political change domestically uh nearly all the remarks for i think you'd almost need a companion book uh, looking 50 years had said how did pakistan's obsession with india change how did that happen because you could i'm making the observation that unless this very process that you're talking about encompasses within it a change in feeling here particularly as one looks outward at at the the uh, as i say obsession with india it's very easy to see why some of this can't happen if that continues to weigh as heavily as it does there's another area which well let me say just in that context also recognize that pakistan doesn't sit there alone it's in it's in an environment a regional environment a global environment which make enormous makes enormous difference for what the the options are uh so we've got to be it's got to be predicated here that you've got a cooperative region one that doesn't intrude with wars and uh and and where other countries can can see here and this is absolutely critical because pakistan has to trade it has it has to it has to find its way in, in by integrating its economy with it with its neighbors so you've got to see it and 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 hope at the same time that you've got this external these external factors which contribute here even if you try to do the right thing domestically you may not get you may get distracted very easily from it. another area which you could go down here is and and here's something which wasn't said here except implied perhaps <clears throat> these changes have to bring with them social cultural changes they have to essentially change a lot of pakistan's political culture if this kind of coming together and and wisdom here that evolves over doesn't also change the way people think about uh their own society the mind india but their own society uh and we're talking here about pluralism and tolerance and the rest and so the good news would be yes and that's one of the byproducts of what you're talking about i think that that's uh for um and then we have those black swans out there uh drought uh, <laughs> uh uh hurricanes and so on which you know again l- laid a west- waste some of the most wonderful <laughs> plans that we have and finally let let me say that this approach is evolutionary 
it, 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 and it's systemic. But let's be honest here. Where we have seen real changes, they've often come about in the most abrupt, even violent ways. We, we're we more likely to see changes which break with the past, with revolutions, with civil disturbances. <clears throat> uh, these, unfortunately, are sometimes what break the log jam, what open up possibilities. Yes, even war here. Uh, and so it's a sobering fact here that as we see this as, uh, as inspiring us, that we recognize we, we may be going against history here uh, in terms of, ec of expectations here. But that doesn't mean that it, it, it has eliminated this. But I'm saying that, that if it happened, it would be not only inspirational for Pakistan, but for a lot of other countries. Thank you very much. Uh, we have very little time left for questions and answers, and I think that that's what uh, uh, is <laughs> the heart of, of, of an exercise like this. So I had about six pages of uh, quotes and comments on the book. Uh, I'm going to spare you all those, and I'm going to tell a joke instead. And the, it's, 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 it's a South Asian joke that uh, somebody uh, is talking to a friend and says, so, uh, you and a tiger are in a barren place. Um, what happens? The guy says, I get away. He says, OK. How do you get away? The guy says, I hide in a cave. He says, no, 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 no. This is a totally barren place. It's a desert. There's no cave there. He says, oh, I find the nearest rocks, and I hide behind the rocks. He says, no rocks there either. He says, oh, OK, well, there must be, there. you know, I, I jump into the uh, uh, in, into the water and I swim across and of course uh, the tiger cannot swim uh, if I go completely under the water. He said, no, 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 there's no water, don't you understand? That's you, You've got it all wrong. Uh, you have to explain to me how you got away. And the guy turns around and says, eh, I'll probably, you know, uh, bury myself under the sand. He says, that's absurd. I mean, you know, obviously the tiger will be able to smell you and so the guy turns around and says, you're not very sympathetic to me here, are you? You seem to be on the side of the tiger. <laughs> so I think that, uh, as Dr. Weinbaum said, uh, as an aspirational manifesto, this is an excellent, excellent mm -hmm. explanation. Mm -hmm. However, uh, I'm the guy who wants to ask the questions about how did you get there? Uh, which There's no river, so how do you swim? There's no cave, how do you hide? The basic question I have, but I will leave it out there and wait for Nadeem to answer, because I think because of the time, what I'm going to do is I'm going to invite audience questions, four, five, six questions together, and then Nadeem can do a kind of a summary right. in which he can answer all those questions. Right. My question is that you cannot actually have an aspiration without also, because after all, economics, as I, I wasn't trained to be an economist, but the basic economics I learned was it's about ends, but it's also about means. And so the means, I mean, it's all nice that, you know, there will be networks and everybody will see. It's a, it's, it's a great aspiration. But we know that that's not how things in the real world work. So are you basically saying, like that guy was saying to this other guy, that if you are caught with a tiger uh, and, and, and have nowhere to go, then you will end up being devoured by the tiger? Or, are, or do you actually plan to write a, another book, which I actually have an idea, where you will actually lay out all these great ideas, how do you get them into practice? Because one of the things you say in your book is uh, you list many things about the elites and their way of thinking. Why and how do elites ever relinquish control? Uh, this is you know, the political class, the military, which you have not touched upon at all in your book or in your presentation, the um, 
bullers, yeah, I mean, okay, so we put more schools in DHAs or everywhere else. Uh, will that somehow in reduce the influence? Will that have a, it's, the means have to be elaborated further, but, you know, this is a great aspiration. Yeah. And for Pakistanis who've become a little, shall we say, uh, emotionally upset continuously by critiques and criticism, it's a very healthy and a positive thing that somebody is saying, hey, there could be a great day, you know, 30, 40 years from now. Uh, but uh, very frankly, uh, th that great day getting there is as much an issue as uh, defining what that great day would look like. And maybe perhaps in Pakistan's history, we have had far too many pictures of a brilliant future presented to us and not enough uh, pathways laid out how to get there. So I'll stop my comment here and open it to the floor. Uh, yes, sir, right there. Just wait for the mic, it'll be brought. Yeah. And I'm going to take four or five questions to make sure. this shorter, and then Nadim can take all the questions sure. in one go. So make note. Mm -hmm. Don't worry. Mm. Go on, go on, go on. Full journalist in Pakistan. I'm currently working as an investment analyst here. Um, my question is, um, so I read the book, and the, the couple of things that come out across, one, of course, your point about land, which I think is, is, is actually an excellent insight, uh, but you really hate the donors. I mean, like, you really, really hate them. Um, and, you know, you have your reasons for that, but then sort of the existential question then is, then why have this conversation here in Washington, D.C.? Let's be honest. The only people who came to this, I mean, I mean, it's nice that, you know, the Americans in the audience are here, but frankly, Americans think about Pakistan as a national security concern. That is the end of the conversation as far as Pakistan is concerned in Washington, D.C. Yeah. Why bother talking when, let's be honest, that's part of the problem? Uh, right here in the front. Mm. Right here. Raise your hand so that he can see that. That's, you're the one who wants the mic, yeah. Dr. Asim Yusuf, the University of Maryland. Um, this was certainly a great theoretical framework for a discussion. Um, data collection is the most important aspect. And I understand in developing countries there is not a great apparatus to collect data. But the Pakistani record is really abysmal. If we look at the census, the data was collected after 18 long years. So there was no census for 18 years. The current census except one province, most of the politicians from Karachi, from Quetta, Peshawar, and especially from Fata, they have actually rejected the census results. What are your thoughts on that? How do we believe those numbers, which are the most important aspect for anything which is coming for any developmental activities, for any planning? Right there, so we can... We, we I actually had intended to, the, to say yeah, anything. So I've recognized most of you. I will, uh, we'll finish this, then we'll go there and sure. do that. Yeah. Just to follow up on your comment. Um, so I had the privilege of working with Dr. Haq on um, the growth strategy that this book is based on. And I just wanted to share an anecdote with you that um, when I went to Islamabad to see, it was a two-day conference, I believe it was a two-day conference, to present the uh, growth strategy. And, um, and, and Nadim did two things uh, that were unusual. Um, one was he insisted that about half the audience be young people. Um, and the other was that at the end of this meeting, and I, I was looking for the picture so I could tweet it, but it is the honest fact. He was absolutely swarmed. I mean, I would say it was about 80 young people who came up to him afterwards and would not let him leave. And the second thing that he did was that was unusual was he stayed and talked to them and engaged in serious dialogue. And it was clear that this was the, the high point. This was the entire purpose of the meeting for Nadim. So Nadim is here, but I just want to vouch for him that when the moment was there and he was in a position of power, he had youth in the room and he respected their voice and he listened to them. And I have to say, in all the time I've worked in public policy, it was it was really, you know, it was an inspiring moment. I'm just telling you honestly. So it made me proud to have worked on that project. Thank you very much. I would have vouched for him anyway and probably much more briefly. No, no, and I know, I know many of you know Nadim and whatever, but I'm just right at the back. Yes. 
as well. Good. Thank you for the presentation. Always a treat to hear you speak. Uh, my question relates to one of those circles, uh, the one which was about quality governance. Okay. And um, so to what extent do you think uh, public sector inefficiencies and corruption is driven by low sector wages, low public sector wages? Yeah. And is there anything that Pakistan has tried in the past, uh, public sector reforms that have worked? And to what extent? Okay, thanks. Okay, three more questions. So raise your hands and I'll see which ones uh, sound okay. Mm -hmm. Right here and there. Geographic balance in the room. Good. I think I understand far more clearly than before why Pakistan is not only a fragile state, fair state, but possibly a failed state. What I would like to hear is what are the forces operating which might find a pathway to something better? Right here in the middle. And then the last question right there. So, yeah. Um, I'm my, my name is Mohinder Gulati. I worked in the World Bank and the UN. And thank you very much for an excellent presentation. It was absolutely invigorating. Um, let me just first complete the joke that Hussain started. And the last part of the joke is, he says, how did you actually escape? He said, I just assumed there was no tiger. <laughs> Good point. Okay. I'm from India. I heard your story. This was the story of India in 1970s. And I worked in the bank, in, in the world, in, in the government and the private sector, and then in the bank. Um, the story was exactly the same in India. Maybe it is the same because we are so similar. And that is why we are brother enemies. <laughs> the, it, the, the economy and the politics and the, and the society, they are all three nodes of a triangle linked by uh, very loose springs. And you can pull one in, in, in any direction and the others will follow uh, up to a point. The point of intervention, you can pick and choose your point of intervention depending on where you are. It could be economy, it could be politics, it could be the society. In India, it was the economy. It was only the 1992 crisis and it was a huge crisis. It was only the 1992 crisis which forced India to open up the economy and it then had an impact on the politics. Politics also became more liberalized and also the society became more liberalized. Now, I don't know what is the appropriate angle for Pakistan, but perhaps economy would be the right, right point of intervention. Last question right behind you. Please raise your hand again so that she can see that I'm pointing at you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, my name is Bill Mikhail. I teach political science at George Washington University, and my question is political. Um, Pakistan at 70, how it would be treated by the Trump administration? Oh. Okay. okay, so you've got quite a few questions, but you've got about five minutes. Left. No problem. No problem. No problem. Economics at its best. Look, um, I'll group them into something. I think what um, Marvin asked a few other people, question is how this will happen, what are the social, cultural, political changes that are necessary. And everybody is perplexed by this how question, Pakistan. Everybody has this engineering model in mind. Somebody will come and do it. But let me take you back in history. Think about it. We are sitting there in 1750. And we think that these the Louis the 18th or whatever, he's absolutely secure. They're having these lovely parties, Versailles, etc. We've got this thing. The, George III is secure here. Everything is fine. Marvin, you're absolutely right. It required violent changes to make things happen. But I think the violent changes, if you think about it, were preceded by Renaissance thinkers. And those thinkers eventually fed into your constitution into all the constitutional changes that took place in the world. A change was never linear. Change was never without. I mean, even England take, for example, elites, by the way, never disappear. As I said, right now here, the 1% is ruling. And uh, there's enough evidence to, and it comes every day, you can read it. The 1% elite still rules. In the Trump administration, somebody asked about it. It is elite rule, very simple. In fact, the Trump administration, the good thing about the Trump administration now is there is no difference between you and us. You have Ivanka, we have Mariam, right? You have the family rule, we have family rule too. 
you have the president does whatever you so that's forget that right the point is very simple that change could be violent but ideas all i'm saying is ideas lead the change and the ideas were produced by it was voltaire or you know uh, rousseau and you know whatever montesquieu who led the change not the revolution revolution the faith complete happens eventually same thing this now we are losing the idea battle to the mullah mullah is putting forward ideas we are not putting forward ideas and that's our failing unfortunately right there's the, the other important point to remember is that unfortunately if you don't have local thinkers you will have external thinkers somebody has to come in with ideas and you're absolutely right farooq donors are coming i don't hate them not at all i work for the donors if for god's sake all my life i work for the donors i still work for them the point is we have to have a dialogue with them i mean what you are exhibiting farooq and i've told this to you before as well what you're exhibiting is a typical deference to the donor it's the same thing that we have to other things like religion hey we will not question it so you're saying we should not question the donor no i'm saying we should engage in a dialogue we should question and we should criticize them we criticize ourselves too but bulk of my book is criticizing myself our own if you read it another way it's an analysis criticizing the current situation and the donors are only a part of it but it's not criticizing them now corruption and wages uh, very simple i don't think you can get rid of corruption i've written papers on this before too but i think and when i wrote papers in standard economics i was restricted in the way i look at it i don't think you can get rid of corruption unless you change the system of governance and unless you change the perks you will not change corruption because right now these guys you have legalized corruption by giving them plots and perks that's legalized corruption once you legalize corruption there are other ways of maximizing things you because you can do it so that's an important thing on the, on the pathways to better look there are there, as i said there are umpteen pathways and change is never linear the evolutionary approach that i'm talking about complex adaptive systems it is not offering you a linear change like the standard model is it is offering you directions of change those four circles i said but that doesn't mean that's the only thing to be done that's a step by step approach you take it and then you move forward um i think um, you know this thing about data we can discuss that else but i mean data is an important thing but i think data also is a problem in our subject data really is like the lamp light we are led by the data we forget about all the data that we don't have so often i have heard this said by to me in gathering like hey what's the evidence you have to follow the evidence the evidence has what has presented to me just like this new thing that's coming out randomized control trials which is very frustrating so somebody collects a data for 5 years and then comes out hey i've discovered like i saw this very interesting thing the other day what is it very interesting that yeah they went to africa they showed kids a movie they spent 2 years and 5 million dollars doing this it's amazing how much money can be wasted in this stuff they they showed kids a movie aspirational movie and then they showed some of the kids they didn't show that and then they said oh aspirational movie increased the grades now if that's data i don't buy it um you know but the and then as far as intervention goes i think we said intervention is a very important thing that we economists need to reconsider we have to cavalier an approach to intervention we think we can intervene everywhere even though we fail we still maintain this myth we can intervene everywhere so i think we have to understand that's why i raised this point what is intervention how do you make policy that's an important thing and we should discuss this well thank you, thank you very much yeah. a big hand to nadeem haq thank you thank you dr weinbaum uh there's lunch so don't go without eating and tomorrow come back uh for an event up on india oh 17, okay great which is on india's economy so look it up on the hudson website mm-hmm. grab your sandwich yeah. see you all tomorrow okay. and the conversation continues thank good. you okay good show thank you